Hello, everybody. Today, myself and Ben are joined by Dom from Cubicle 7 to talk a bit about the company and all things role-playing. Uh, so, Dom, it's great to have you here on the channel. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, so before we dive into what Cubicle 7 and the business is up to, um, I'd like to know a bit about yourself. How did you get into this many varied hobby that is uh, gaming? <laughs> Um, I think it was a combination of things. Um, I think that the uh, um, I've always, as long as I can remember, been interested in fantasy and science fiction and all that sort of stuff. I think uh, um, the uh, my favourite ch- uh, schoolyard game was Star Wars, um, where of course I had to be Luke Skywalker. And uh, um, yeah, that, I think that probably is one of my earliest school memories is playing Star Wars <laughs> at punch times. Um, so, yeah. That's uh, that, that started off. It started me off on the right course, um, and then I think you know, just just I was always quite a voracious reader. Um, so uh, yeah, just anything uh, weird and wonderful that I could get my hands on um, was was devoured instantly. Um, so uh, and I think that you know that the uh, um, making my way through the town and school libraries um, eventually brought me into contact with um, some of the fighting fantasy books mm-hmm. and Lone Wolf. And uh, yeah, didn't look back after that. So uh, yeah, those um, solo game books uh, were definitely a, um, a path on the way. Then uh, I think through the next one was uh, my cousin, Simon Lucas, who uh, actually works uh, for Pinnacle um, now. Um, so yeah, he's, he's in the, the gaming industry as well. Um, and uh, we, we were visiting his house and he was painting some skeletons. Um, and just my eyes went like saucers. I think, what is this? <laughs> where, where has it been hiding all my life? Um, so uh, the... Um, uh, yeah, uh, that he introduced me to Games Workshop mm-hmm. and uh, Talisman I started with and that quickly led on to Blood Bowl and uh, Warhammer Fantasy Battle and uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, my, my introduction to roleplaying was read the book, try and run a game for your friends, which I think I've... Uh, um, said in many interviews now, it's probably the worst role-playing game ever run by anybody. Um, I think, it, <laughs> I think every, everybody's first I think that's always the GMing. Case. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, like there, there's a lot of book flipping and a lot of, I can't find it, here's what I think is going to happen. Yeah. And yeah. it's not necessarily a bad way to start, to be fair. No, no. And well, I kept, I think half of the players turned into long-term gamers, so it, it can't have been too bad. Yeah. Um, so uh, from there, and then uh, Bridgend YMCA uh, Games Club was uh, played a big part in my adolescence, um, and from there, sort of got got interested in um, uh, lots of other games as well. So they were sort of historics, and then some of the um, yeah, Napoleonic War gaming was, uh, was a big one in the club, um, as well as um, you know continuing with uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and um, there were some people who you know, did some D and D. Um, which weirdly D and D featured, I would say, um, amongst the lightest in all of the games that that I played um, mm-hmm. uh, during my adolescence. So yeah, lots of um, lots of World of Darkness. The uh, I think I was in a little bit of World of Darkness. Yeah, it's great. Well, absolutely, absolutely. I think the, I, the formative age as well for that one. I think um, uh, yeah, I was uh, French coats to shades and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I> think... <laughs> The Matrix long before the Matrix came along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever the South Wales approximation of the Matrix is. <laughs> I think it's Torchwood. <laughs> I think it is. I think it might well be. <laughs> yeah. I do love that. That's one of the... Um, I, I, I always love Torchwood for giving us the... Um, uh, the the old woman walking along the side of the street when uh, they they pull up and ask if anybody's seen there was it a man with a he- fish head or something like that and she just looks disgusted as they drive along <laughs> bloody torchwood and I think <laughs> that's how you know people would react <laughs> it's a sm- small town everybody knows everybody's business yeah absolutely so yes. I take it then the majority of your gaming seems to be focused more on the RPG side than the the miniature side or or is it just that those are the the sort of the ones that you gravitate to more? Um, I think I think I've probably played more role playing games. I, I, I think um, the I, I'm personally probably split fairly 
Oh, with Forex. No, prob- probably, yeah, but role-playing games in the lead. But um, I think, you know, certainly I've always been, um, uh, I've, I've um, yeah, always been involved with, with the Games Workshop hobby um, and uh, kept an interest in historic, historical wargaming, even though I haven't done an awful lot of it <laughs> since I was a teenager, really, I think. Uh, um, I think there's that kind of, um, especially when you're sort of like moving around a fair amount, then you lose a lot of those kind of setups that you need for, you know, the, the yeah. reliable access to space and terrain. And <laughs> all it's that easier to have a book uh, than to have a, a couple Much of bigger more cases worth of, of armies and boxes yeah. worth of pills. Yeah. Yep, so. definitely. Yes. So, uh, so, yeah, I think I've probably done more role play. I mean, and I think there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, I think I've played quite quite broadly um, with RPGs as well. So, uh, um, and again, I think with with, uh, with with role playing games, you can do that uh, a lot more easily than uh, than with some of the uh, the more uh, involving and uh, expensive um, to hobbies to to jump around sure. from one thing to another. Um, yeah, yeah, and board games, you know, as well has been a a, a feature of um, truly more more adult um, gaming life. I think. Mm. Um, the uh, it wasn't something um i think when, when you're a kid the um you've got that big upfront investment with board games haven't you maybe for for each one so yeah. maybe it's easier to stick with a role-playing game and play yeah <clears throat> maybe 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 it's a uh, financial thing <laughs> but uh, yeah uh pretty much everything um and loads of video games and um yeah so how did then the the hobby uh segue into work for you did, did you go mm. v- in a, a sort of direct route through companies, or was it a, a segue that you made much later on? Uh, it was yeah later on. So the um, I think w- when I was um, you know coming to the end of school, I did you know think about um, whether it was something that that I could pursue. But I think certainly at the time, I saw there was you know maybe maybe joining Games Workshop could be a route. I think they they had the um, the apprenticeships were starting up when I was around about that age for the, the design studio. And, um, but I think, you know, in, in um, from, from where I saw, I thought that the, the number of people in full-time employment in, in tabletop gaming uh, was so small. Um, and the, um, you know, I thought that he had a games workshop or I don't know what I had in my head. Maybe there were like, you know, 30 people working at TSR in, mm. in the States. Again, because you know, it was pre-internet. I did no research. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of thought, no, that sounds too good to be true. Let's just write that off, shall we? Mm. Um, and um, yeah, went on to do, to do other things. So um, the, uh, yeah, and, and had a, a range of, of entertaining jobs. Um, I think uh, I sold frozen fish door to door. That was a good one. Um, and uh, what else? Um, my joy service station. That was mm-hmm. always <laughs> an entertaining place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a bit later on, then I had um, I, I spent a while in um, the civil service, mm-hmm. and uh, then was uh, doing internal communications and organisational development advising. Um, which is probably the longest job title anybody needs to ever have. No, it's way longer than anybody <laughs> needs to have. But um, uh, yes, yeah, so in the background of all of this, still gaming and with contacts I've made through gaming, um, it was really like the, the route to um, to starting Cubicle 7. So uh, it was um, some Angus um, in my games group who uh, worked at Leisure Games and um, had basically seen loads of other games companies. You know, he'd been over to the States um, mm. buying for leisure games. So um, uh, knew, knew that it was a possibility. And then just through conversations that we had, it was like, oh, okay, maybe this is something that we could actually do. Um, yeah, which led to um, yeah, Cubicle 7 being incorporated on the 22nd of December um, in 2006. Almost so, your birthday. Yeah, almost 15 years. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was it was um, you know very much evenings and weekends mm. kind of, you know, obviously I hoped that it could become something more, but um I think you know didn't uh didn't want to get too carried away because that was too wonderful a possibility. What, what was the what was the first big project that you can remember working on with Cubicle 7? Um, so Slay Industries, Hunter Sheets, I was, oh, okay. I, I was editing. Um, so, uh, yeah, there was a crossover with, uh, 
um, uh, Nightfall and um, or Nightfall games. So uh, Slay was one of the first things on the slate for Cubicle Seven, um, and uh, Victoriana as well. The um, yeah, Steam mm. Victorian magic, yeah, <laughs> which we're bringing back at the moment. So yeah. uh, it's latest outing. Um, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, uh, it was great. You know, it was it was really good, good fun. You know, it was you know that kind of you know when you get to um, explore your hobby in that kind of you know in that kind of way. Um, um, but you know, at the time, it was like, yes, it was. It felt a bit pipe dream. I, I think because it was just it was yeah too good to be true. It would have been so cool to if if it did work that I didn't want to dare believe that it could. <laughs> just <laughs> so when you were getting stuck into it initially, then was it from a um, a writing point of view or a production um, point of view for so helping out the likes of likes of Nightfall uh, in producing the, the Hunter Sheets was that mm. something where you went I have an idea for you or did they approach you going well we need somebody to, to lay this out and, and get it sort of yeah it was published. more those oh sorry <laughs> yeah it was more that more the um, um, that start of um, uh, taking something that that um, and, and and getting it getting it out. Um, so the I think it was you know early on. I think um, I I wanted to you know I think we we everybody gets into the business wants to bring their own you know do their own thing and uh, and bring it out. But I think I was kind of aware um, that I wanted to to also to create a company as well that mm-hmm. um, that would be a kind of like a sustainable vehicle, you know, the, um, the, the something that would turn um, uh, turn into a a thing that could be done as a you know as as a as a full time job. Mm-hmm. And I think the I mean certainly we went well before Kickstarter. Um, mm. It was there was quite a barrier to or more of a barrier to entry um, in terms of, of um, you know having an actual company um, mm. rather than you know the, the um, uh, a self publishing um, I don't know what to describe you know, a self publishing small company yeah. um, so um, I think it was a a combination oh, sorry I have to edit that bit out. <laughs> Ah, should have, that's amateur, isn't it? Should have <laughs> had that one turned off to start. Um, right, so should we start from the, what was that question? It was... Uh, whether you were aiming to be a, a publishing house. Or, oh, yes. Or a... uh, yeah, from, from the start, um, I wanted to set up a, a sustainable publishing company. Um, so I wanted to, um, to yeah, to, to have that kind of uh, a base that was... Um, a uh, a solid foundation, um, mm. and I think that that meant that it couldn't be just publishing things that um, you know that I'd written or, or the other people who were involved in Cubicle Seven at the time had written. Sure. Um, I think we needed to do a little bit. Um, uh, it it need, needed a higher rate of output in order to mm. yeah, you yeah you need to, to have a catalogue there to sustain the the business yeah. absolutely. Um, and and I think that the the we were quite clear earlier on as well that the the best way to go about that would be to look at the licensing route mm-hmm. um, and see what was available for us to uh, to to kind of like um, get us a few extra rungs up on the ladder in short order. So mm-hmm. I think you know that, that uh, a company that's not really known for anything, you you know you you will get some attention, but it's much easier to to get people to look at you if uh, you've got a brand that they they are familiar with and. Uh, uh, and love and it just yeah so happened that um all of the brands that we uh, we ended up working on were stuff that i was really passionate about and <laughs> uh, and really loved from an early age <laughs> so uh, i think uh, i think that's sort of like half half direction and half sort of like what was in front of us but <laughs> uh, um yes i couldn't have designed it any better if i tried yeah mm. so you, you had things like the likes of working with uh, chaosium on the, yes. the Cthulhu line, which is a big one for me. In fact, several of those books are on the top shelf with my other Cthulhu yes. books. Um, <laughs> because they, they are, I mean, Cthulhu Britannica is, is an absolutely gorgeous slash legendary book. Uh, but you. being able to come in and work alongside somebody like Chaosium uh, and mm. give it your own unique spin so you're not just replicating more 1920s, you know, pushing on having the, the World War Cthulhu uh, sort of stuff there is opens up a whole new realm for for players of of call of cthulhu and and that's 
I think something that stood out for me whenever I was looking at it, because for a long time, when I, I, I approach a game, I would pick up the initial rule book. Doesn't matter what the game is, but I wouldn't buy a huge amount of supplements mm. because I would look at it and go, well, I can make up my own stuff for that world and I'll go yeah. and buy another game and another game and another game. But um, Cthulhu was one where it, it sort of broke that mold and I would go, okay, well, I'd really like to do something in, uh, in Scotland. Mm. Uh, and I wonder what stuff is out there. And then you come across <laughs> the likes of the, the stuff that you, you'd done um, or even the World War Cthulhu um, because it's bad enough, all of that nightmarish stuff happening in the, in the twenties or in gaslight. But then when you pull it into the middle of a, a massive industrial war, then there's a whole other layer of, of terribleness mm. on top. Um, and it was, it was then that you kind of look to see what else the company's doing. And so you're, you're right from that point of view, having, um, a licensed product expands what people are going to be. Uh, exposed to you uh, and to your stuff, especially in the, I suppose, proto internet age and, and before Kickstarters uh, and yeah. that sort of thing, because leisure games, I, I would get the leisure games catalog every, yeah. every month <laughs> and flip through. And it was just a black and white listing, essentially. You know, you're, you're, people today are probably going to go, well, you gray haired old Ben should go off into a corner and get your carpet slippers on. But, <laughs> but you, you would go through, you would go through with a fine tooth comb to see what they had coming in and who it was yeah. being made by and, and go, oh, that sounds interesting. And you would have very little outlet to go and find out about these things. Um, yeah. So, so having the license, having a, a name behind it was always a, a big draw, mm. uh, certainly for me anyway. Um, moving from the, the sort of the licensing part then, mm. what point did you start developing more of your own in-house uh, sort of games? Was that uh, an immediate thing alongside the licensing or did it take a little while longer to get the people in place to actually start writing and developing your own? Um, so yes, yeah, so both really. I, th I think the um, things that are our own, like Victoriana, mm -hmm. uh, we released uh, fairly early on and that, that was our first any award-winning product as well. So that, mm -hmm. that was lovely. Um, and, uh, I think even, even with, uh, some of the, you know, sort of like some of the Cthulhu stuff you were, you were talking about there, um, there was a lot of our own sort of, um, uh, setting development going into that. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I think yeah, with, with the, the darkest hour for, for World War Cthulhu, obviously World War Two. Mm -hmm. I mean, really that for me, that was the, you know, what, what, well, there's this, um, the horror and the chaos going on in, um, in in the world, so like what what's the opportunity that the um, the things that are in the the cracks and corners and you know what what what, uh, what do they what what advantage do they take of this chaos and things mm -hmm. like that? So uh, I think um, yeah, the, the, the Cthulhu stuff was was for me it was really interesting because it was a um, I think me getting a bit more uh, confidence as well um, in um, you know like you say when we to start off we we, ha we needed to have a breadth of things that we were working on. Um, and um, so I'd sort of like be, um, you know, we, we had the third party program as well, which was great and um, helped us bring out a load of really cool games um, that other people had, had developed that might not have uh, got um, out to people um, or might not have found, found gamers before, you know, uh, before if they were in a much smaller circulation. Um, so, you know, that, that was really cool. Um, and then with the um, doing a lot of the like um, you know, directing things and um, um, commissioning and editing and you know that that kind of stuff. So um, it was a uh, sort of like a a, um, a gradual change as well. I think with getting a bit more confidence and a bit a few more titles under my belt as well. Mm -hmm. I think um, to um, yeah being a bit more. Um, Diverse, That's the word. yeah, yeah. I think so. And just you know, the, the my personal involvement, I suppose, in in um, in, in what we were doing as well. So, uh, um, yeah, the, the Cthulhu things, I think, was that they, they always had that kind of part for me of um, of a uh, yeah. I think a slight kind of um, uh, growth in you yeah. know, doing my own thing a bit more, and I think having a bit more confidence in in, in what I was doing. So yeah, there was a, a, a warm spot in my heart. <laughs> so you're saying you're very you're very proud of the the work you did with the Cthulhu roleplay and that kind of thing. Mm. But was was there any other sort of project that you were like, 
uh, I got obviously I assume you get very passionate about all of your projects. Of course. <laughs> yeah, but there, there, yeah, there are probably some that are like very, very close to your heart. Sort of yeah. some of those earlier ones. Are there any others that were like, oh, I absolutely adored doing that and working on that or trying out new mechanics and that kind of thing? Yeah, no, oh, absolutely. So I think that the, um, you know, a few years later on as well, then when um, uh, I, I think, you know, we were doing Adventures in Middle Earth, um, that was, you know, a, a huge thing for me. Um, and I think that was, you know, the, um, um, yeah, that, that, were, that was, um, a um, yeah a, a great um experience i think as well i think you know i, I think that you know being the person to bring um D D, I can say now that i'm not publishing it and um and middle earth together for the first time i think i have yeah. to say the world's greatest role-playing game and middle earth <laughs> together oh, yeah. for the first time. <laughs> no whatever the uh um but uh, yeah, that, that that felt like a thing, you know. There's been a few sort of milestones. Um, I think you know, getting the Doctor Who license to start with was yeah. you know, was, yeah. was amazing. Um, which you know, I, we we didn't think that we were going to get that in a million years. Um, but uh, I think you know, probably goes to show that you should have a bit more. <laughs> you have a bit more faith in myself. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, when we were um, the, the first meeting that we went in with the BBC, we were very much thought, you know, well, this is the first license we've gone for. This is uh, it'll be good sort of pitch practice. <laughs> um, uh, and um, yeah, then we were invited back for the second one. It was terrifying because we suddenly had something to lose. <laughs> uh, but you know, it was it was just great. Um, so we you know that that, and then um, there's been some kind of like you know business businessy ones. Like you know, the first time going to you know, going to actual Manhattan for a, an actual business meeting um, <laughs> was uh, yeah that 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 um, that that was that was big. And I like, seeing. Um, um, yeah, one of the top two, top two card game in Barnes and Noble on Fifth Avenue when I was on that trip as well. Just like in a really kind of like, oh, this is this is cool. <laughs> we did this, this thing. I didn't expect <laughs> this in a million years. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I think yeah, the, the um, um, Adventures of Middle Earth and yeah, bringing Five E and um, or bringing uh, yeah, the world's greatest role playing game and Middle Earth together for the first time. That, that felt it felt a bit historic, you know. That that was cool. felt like a moment. Yeah, I, I, yeah that that was great. Yeah. Um, and then uh, when uh, you know when Games Workshop approached me to um, ask me to take on the um, uh, uh, Warhammer Fantasy role play mm -hmm. and um, Age of Sigma um, Soulbound as well, that was uh, like a huge kind of um, yeah, you know, pinch me kind of moment. But, but thinking of the the Warhammer Fantasy role play, then what was it like during those initial steps, sort of working out how you're going to approach the new edition mm. uh, and sort of play around with it? Because obviously, it takes a lot of cues from sort of second edition and, and first edition, of course, yeah. but also plays around with a couple of things as well to make it a little bit sort of more nuanced and stuff. But obviously yeah. you died and had to do a lot of interesting stuff with this to try and bring it back. And then the enemy within as well was a huge part of that. So can you yes. sort of talk us through that story a little bit there? So, yes, yeah, so when I was uh, looking at, um, you know, what we could do, um, I think, you know, the once I'd recovered from the the, the sheer giddy delight, then, um, <laughs> um, I think that, the, you know, I wanted to make sure that it was, um, uh, you know, that it, it was a, a Warhammer fantasy role play that, that, that people would um, would would strongly recognize. Um, I think I, I definitely wanted to get the, the feel right. Um, and um, I wanted to, you know, just give it, give the fourth edition as as um, solid a grounding as I could. So um, the the first sort of the plans were, um, you know, to do with you know how that rule book was going to feel and and the sort of like the the, the look it would have, um, and the um, and yeah, what would be the initial support. So I think w w with all of the the kind of anniversaries that were flying around at the time, I think that um, a, you know, revisiting the enemy within seemed like a really good place to start. It, it was such an essential campaign, I think, for for getting Waffra its start, um, mm. and uh, you know the, the all of the um, the Empire the information that grew out of um, the you know the enemy within. And it, it was uh, it seemed like a really um, uh, yeah, just like a really solid place to start, and, and let's get it getting. Get it. I think partially, I just wanted to get back in print as well for everybody. You know, people, <laughs> people who'd never had the chance to have, have a run through it. It was a um, defining, a defining moment, not just for the RPG, but for Games Workshop and Warhammer Fantasy 
itself because those books defined very specific things that have gone on in the 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 tabletop war game for the next 30 years but they they were part and parcel of the rpg they hadn't existed before that mm. and it's 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 like those legendary campaigns certain games have them and everybody knows them uh cthulhu's um mountains of madness yeah is another one and people hear about them and hear about them all the time but then they've been out of print for 15 20 years uh, and so offering up a whole new generation the opportunity to explore and play them uh, and not just hear it secondhand from you know old gamers going oh you know <laughs> it was better in my day we had this <laughs> epic and you know if any campaign could be described as epic the enemy within certainly fits that bill you know that's that's a, a campaign setting that people would play for years yeah uh, and would have you know <laughs> genre defining um games in there uh so that was exciting in and of itself to see it come back mm. a campaign i never got to finish a campaign i never really got out of the first book in because we kept yeah. messing up so badly <laughs> it, it is not a fluffy game for new players to uh explore and fall their way uh, fall forward and that would be, uh, it <laughs> yeah. doesn't really happen with this uh, but whenever you, whenever you brought it back it wasn't just a, a straight reprint either which was mm. well a really not just a nice touch i suppose but um a really good innovation that if you are sitting there and you've got your 25 30 year old copy of the enemy within sitting on a shelf it was an opportunity to re-explore the setting and the game but with new parts to to um dangle in front of your players i suppose to engage both the gm and the players who maybe have already played through the story in some fashion without it just being a, a trite uh re rewriting of it um mm. and that that and the, the companion books um is a, a superb combination when you put them together because it's it's not just we've got the original files from whoever published it originally and yeah. uh, and and now we're just going to run them through a new printer with a different cover on it it's not that there's so much more <laughs> within it uh, yeah, it's, not, it's not the cubicle seven way I, was, no. I can't help myself i have to <laughs> get in there and... <laughs> no no let's see what we can do here it's uh but uh yeah the, those grog boxes are great i think for um, just giving a load of, i mean options for anybody you know if there's um you know people who haven't run it before i think even might prefer something that's presented as an option sure. and yeah. Uh, yeah yeah i think that they've worked out really well um but yeah you can always surprise that the people who want to uh try and read ahead or <laughs> anybody who remembers <laughs> it from before you can throw them throw them many curveballs so, yes yeah, that's yeah. That's great. Um, Threw them under the war wagon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> see how it goes. Um, so with the likes of Warfrup then, um, having explored so intensively mm. a, a classic campaign, is the, the plan for that then to move into more of your own uh, mm. new material next? Or yeah, absolutely. A bit, of, a bit of back and forth between old and new? Yeah, there's... Um, we, I mean, while we've been doing the enemy within, um, there were you know, there, there were some other um, things that we've been able to fit in around it as well. So uh, now, Middenheim was you know, a revisit of, um, of, of a previous edition, but you know, with a with a very heavy update, um, and an old dwarf as well, uh, the big old dwarf source book. Um, that, that's fantastic, and uh, the archives of the Empire, which give you a load of different kind of like really fun, uh, kind of like magazine article kind of length. Um, additions and um uh, you know extra things to, to to put in little locations and uh interesting people and things like that so that, that'll be a series that we continue with for a while um i think with the um uh the um yeah we've got plans for um, some player focus books that we're looking at um you know more military careers is mm -hmm. the first one up in arms uh, we can get a magic book and some you know bestriesque stuff imperial zoo should be uh going off mm, the order before yeah. too much longer or maybe he already has so. <laughs> <laughs> depending on when this goes out um yeah so uh, no it, it's um 
uh, loads of stuff planned. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, we just love it all so much. You know, honestly, it was trying to refine the plans down into, okay, what can we do in, in the next year or the next two years, the next three years? You know, can't there's just there's so many things planned. Yeah. That, it can't yeah. just be all worth it all the time as much no, as I would enjoy that. <laughs> I, mean, I, think I, I love as well, I think that, that um, uh, you know, the the, um, the the waffer up rule book was one that I got to yeah to 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 um, to, work, to, you know, to to work on to a large degree. So that that was that was really good. I think um, the uh, yeah, like you were saying there with the, you know so those design choices and things like that. So it was you know when I was um, sitting there with the big blank bit of paper in front of me, um, uh, that was um, that was that was yeah fantastic, like a dream come true kind of kind of territory as well. Um, and then you know, moving through the um, you know, which uh, which systems we were going to be implementing in, in what way. Obviously, we you know, I wanted to keep it with the D one hundred. I think because that was my uh, my first one from I grew up with as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Uh, um uh yeah and and that's sort of like the stat line that that everybody's familiar with and um yeah not not um uh not not tweaking too much i think you know the challenge of um br- bringing something of you know some of the advances in game design um and rpg system design over the last uh, 30 years um you know that that was something that i wanted to build in as well but i think i think i kind of i, I tend to be quite outcome focused um and sort of feel of the game focused and i probably do put that ahead of um strict probability wrangling um sure. i think for me a rule system has to feel like an impartial and fair yeah. arbitrator more than it has to necessarily accurately be that. <laughs> um, so, I'm, yeah, I mean, some people true, will, yeah. you know, so, <laughs> I'm going to read the comments, put it that way. But, <laughs> uh, but I think it's got to be fun. It's got to be yeah. engaging and fun. And, it, and it's... Um, Still uh, as brutal I, as ever as well, I will. I will yeah, absolutely. To, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I, one of the big things I wanted to do was uh, make sure that, that, that we were speeding up resolution and outcome for things. Mm. So um, you know, things like um, in combat, making it an opposed test um, to hit. So I think one of one of the um, the pro- you, one of the, one of the things you can run into with a D one hundred system is you can get a lot of failure um, if you're. Um, your modifiers are out or if your tests are out or, you know, depending on where you want to set that kind of, um, uh, see, now I'm going into the problem, you know, where you want to set that 50% chance of success failure, you know, whether that's your your easy, your average, or, you know, I personally in, in games I'm running, I tend to avoid making people roll as much as possible. So um, the um, having like a, a vague awareness of people's skill levels and, um, you know, for the sake of keeping things moving at a fair mm-hmm. clip, um, you know, if I know that somebody is good enough at something, then, you know, I'll, I'll, that, that generally I will let that stuff happen. I don't like making people roll for unnecessary things for the, you know, I mean, you know, build tension with it. Absolutely. You know, that's, um, yeah, one of the tools that you have as a GM, isn't it? But um, I think I don't like slowing things down too much. Um, and uh, I suppose I've always been sort of like hyper aware of, you know, the situations where it's a massive pain in the backside if they fail this particular role. Let's, let's avoid yeah. this situation. <laughs> yeah. um, I can understand yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, sometimes failure is fun, absolutely. Yeah, but but yeah. sometimes it's like, oh no, <laughs> how are they going to spend half an hour trying to work out a way to extend the bridge? <laughs> I'm sure the elf would find the tracks in the forest. That's what exactly. elves are for. <laughs> and yet, that's yeah, feeling. Um, moving away from Warfare then, mm. obviously, but sticking with Games Workshop, you then have two uh, major. IPs with them, so Soulbound mm. and Wrath and Glory. Yeah, um, approaching those, you didn't need to worry about um, sticking to the the old Warframe system. You could explore new mechanics with that, but mm. also explore whole new worlds. Literally, yes. Um, mm. How how much focus are you allowed to to put onto something? before Games Workshop go, well, actually that moves outside where we want you to go. Are you given a lot of rain or are the very sort of challenging parameters that you can explore, but you can explore within sort of boundaries? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it's, um, I think um, 
that yeah I mean, f- first of all it was just like incredibly exciting i think to be um to be able to um you know to to, to work with gw on the first um they just think my role playing game was mm. just amazing um really really exciting um and um i think that the like like all other licensed games i think you know that the, there are the the guidelines and um the the person who you know who who um uh or the, the you know the, the 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 organization that is taking that property forward you know that they they know it inside out and and, and um uh the everything that you do is is run past them, and mm. um, you know, with any any kind of licensing um, sure. arrangements. So, um, I, I'd say it's, it's been very very similar to 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 other things in that regard. Um, and the 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 the, the, uh, the GW team are fantastic help and support. Um, so we we get loads of um, guidance and interaction, and mm. you know, we can we can um, talk about the plans at all stages. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's it's. Been, it's been, you know, it's it just it's been a joy to work on, really, it's been, and, and amazing to watch it all developing. Yeah, because for example, with with Soulbound in particular, I guess in many ways it ena- it would enable a lot of people who were diving into, say, for example, the tabletop game, another avenue to learn lots more about yeah. the the world. And I think this was, in many regards, away from things like the Black Library books, maybe the core rule book. This was a lot of people's chance to kind of explore the realms in a more personal way mm. uh did you feel like there was a lot of stuff that you could have fun with there in that regard sort of like now we're going to talk endlessly about Ug- Ugu or something <laughs> or <Asuki. laughs> yeah. you know, something that was the main setting for the first book and stuff but congratulations yeah. on not mentioning the dirt in there <laughs> <laughs> i'll slip the dirt in there somewhere but yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I, I think that the um, I, what, one of the things I think that um, that that uh, you know, Games Workshop do very well. I think is is, is a lot of that kind of um, uh, the small form world building that they get in there as well. You know, like the um, I was uh, one of the things that jumped out to me in the early days was the use of the Dapple de Frit, the uh, um, uh, the 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 creature, the edible. Um, but if it's prepared incorrectly, uh, it can cause spontaneous combustion. <laughs> and, oh, there's <laughs> Dapple de Frit street food was born. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's uh, so you know, lots of um, you know really tantalising details like that that it's been yeah great to be able to to work in and uh, expand on and uh, yeah that's yeah, been really cool. Mm. One of the other things that's very interesting about Soulbound as well is that it kind of. <laughs> it steps away from rat catchers and dirty soldiers to, I mean, they still exist, I guess, but uh, they may be hunting slightly larger, stranger rats. But anyway, yeah. in, in Soulbound, you've got effectively, in many cases, superheroes going mm. about and stuff. Was there, what, what was it like trying to sort of wrangle that and try and get that across throughout the mechanics? Was it, uh, I'm guessing it was a very interesting experience when you were playtesting and things. But. Yeah, absolutely. It was, um, yeah, trying to get that balance right where you know there's still jeopardy and threats and what but you feel like really you know solid kind of epic characters um so uh i think um the um uh, so the other there was um i designed that one with emmett burn um mm-hmm. it's creative director at Cubicle 7 now and then we were really um keen i mean for, for a few things i think we definitely felt this feels like it should be dice pool i think you want to be throwing a hand you know a chunky handful of dice around the place. Um, I think uh, there's just something satisfying and epic level about dice pool, you know, especially D6. There's something really no nonsense about D6 dice pool. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, as well, you know, people who are familiar with the with the it's game, crossover, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you've got um, it's a it's a familiar activity, isn't it? The, the, the rolling of the handful of D6s. So, um, yeah, we wanted to make sure that um, you know that that was that was a central feature of it. Um, and then, but then we also wanted to make sure that it was as you know as elegant as possible, so that you were getting the maximum information from each die roll, and 
um, you know, we could we could um, ex- extend these systems across everything else as well. So, um, yeah, th- those were kind of the the, uh, the 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 watchwords that we wanted in there. Um, and then, you know, with magic, we wanted something a bit free form as well, so that we you know we could give people spell lists, but also um, it was you know that they could create their own as well. So, uh, which is something I've been trying to do for ages, and finally came together. And so, uh, yeah, that's been been really cool. Um, and um, yeah, I was a huge Ars Magica player back in the day, so and a bit of Mage as well. But yeah, I, I, I've um, absorbed that kind of design your own spell effects um, at, a, at a formative <laughs> age. The biggest baddest spell possible, and hope <laughs> yeah. nothing blows up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, no, that that was great to be able to to do that. Um, uh, what else came together on that one? I think yeah, the, the ladder came together very nicely on that one mm-hmm. for uh, the just a simple way of referencing the difficulty of things was quite interesting yeah. there. So. Yeah, and and, the, and comparative skill levels as well. You're trying to get a um, a way to do that that didn't require any real you know maths. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's there's always a challenge I think between the you know I think you want to. Everything needs you know, as a as a design. You want everything to have the right level of granularity, um, and um, the, that sometimes can be hard to achieve. But no, I think I think we pulled it off really well with Soul Band. I'm really proud of what we did with that one. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's been it's been great to see as well. I think you know, and we always get really good feedback on on what we do, but Soul Band has been. The, you know the best ever um i've seen lots of people say hey my, my new favorite game <laughs> <laughs> which is lovely you know obviously that that's that's so, really really lovely with, to see so with soulbound you you've um well you you released champions of order and you've mm-hmm. got champions of death and things uh you know there's the the all the inklings go towards champions of destruction coming up in the future as well <laughs> have you got any other amazing. sort of plans for that and things sort of going forward what, what else is in in the works for soulbound then uh, so there's a, um, uh, this is where I have to try and remember off the top of my head what we've announced. <laughs> I've, I've I've in terrible in. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, I think I've got a list. Let's see. <laughs> um, what have we said? Um, Champions of Destruction, I think is as far as we've gone. There is, there's loads of stuff in the works. Um, I mean, Champions of Destruction is going to be amazing. You know, yeah. it's, um, uh, when, when we were when we were looking through that one, um, it did cross our minds as like, sh- should should this just be a new rule book? <laughs> it's it's quite a different take, um, as you'd imagine. You know, when you get yeah. the, the Oryx and uh, yeah, there's there's some wonderful sort of like bo- boss mechanics and who is the boss and uh, there's um, yeah, no, fantastic. So I can't wait to to be uh, sharing more on that one. Um, and yeah, lots of stuff. We're going to be looking at a few, a few more uh, like region kind of um, explorations, and um, the yeah, some really exciting ones there, and um, um, a little bit more, you know, more mechanical extensions, more player options as well. So uh, yeah, lots of cool stuff, um, and um, yeah, tracking what happens in the mortal realms. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Jerry also mentioned, obviously, you've got Wrath and Glory. You can see it behind me there as well. Yes. <laughs> so, obviously, you've got the core rulebook out for that, and you've been doing a bunch of sort of campaign stuff for that too, and sort of fleshing out the sector and, and things. But mm. what, what are the plans for Wrath and Glory um, sort of over the next couple of months? Sort of how, where, where are you taking the focus for that and the grim dark future? So the, the next up for that is Church of Steel. Um, mm-hmm. So that's going to be vehicles, lots of uh, vehicle rules and, um, yeah, Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of vehicles. So um, there's <laughs> that. Uh, we've got a starter set um, yeah. in a similar style to uh, our other starter sets. So um, as, uh, if people who aren't familiar with those, we try and uh, make it a, a really good um, you know, first multi-session game uh, with a load of extra adventure seats so that you can keep on uh, keep on playing um, and a you know, presentation of a, a place. So... Uh, um, there is, um, yeah, that is coming, GM screen. Then um, one, one of the, the great things about Wrath and Glory is that it's a really sort of like accessible, get into the action kind of game. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to moving on to some of the more, um, well, just 
some of the different species as well. So, uh, um, yeah, we'll be uh, uh, saying a bit more on that next year. But um, yeah, if we're, uh, I think I think we're still fighting over what's going to be first. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> I say, I say what, what, what's quite good about Wrath and Glory is that it kind of covers, in a, in, a, in a way, a little bit similar to sort of a Warhammer Fantasy roleplay. It covers very a very broad spectrum of different characters that you get to play as. So even yeah. in things like the Wakora book, you've got the chance to play as orcs and chaos cultists and stuff if you want to go down that route as well, which is pretty cool. So it'll be very interesting to see where things go with that one. I was particularly taken, I, I quite like the book, which looked in sort of uh, creating space hulks and stuff. Yeah. That was an interesting way to kind of like, yeah, sort of dungeons in space was a cool idea. I think. It was, <laughs> it was pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think we're re- really, it's, re- it's, it's, we're really enjoying having that kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a place in the in the um, uh, in, in in what we're doing to how we explore some of those smaller ideas and um, you know, bring them together and get them out to everybody because it's um, it's great doing the the, you know, the short PDFs um, mm-hmm. and you know we have um, quite a range now I think of uh, you know, across across everything um, in you know some small adventures or some small kind of um, locations to explore. Um, you know, I think with Wafrop, we've got you know, the Shrines of the Empire and Monuments of the Empire, just some really nice sort of like bits of content that you can drop into your game really easily. Um, and um, but of course, if they're PDF only, then you know people who do prefer to to um, to get the hard copy of stuff, you know, me included, you know, I, I tend to to um, use books a lot more than I use PDFs. So uh, yeah, it's great, it's great to have a place for these things to, to get. I like the, I like the tomes all lined up on the shelf. That's the way. <laughs> <laughs> As Jerry is demonstrating with all his books behind him as well. <laughs> this one's probably going to catch you a little bit off off guard, um, as is my want in life. <laughs> but in the past, we've seen um, fictional characters, whether from novels or comics or um, from game systems from the RPG side, have made their way into the tabletop game uh has there ever been any inkling that any of the the sort of the characters you've developed for either soulbound or wrath and glory uh potentially getting a physical form on the tabletop from games workshop have they ever looked at one of the characters when actually that's that would make an interesting character for whoever it happens Mm. to be yeah that is a good question um Maybe one day. I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> That'd <Yeah>. be great. <laughs> who, who, uh, if you can think of a name off the top of your head, who would you want to pop up? That's the interesting one. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think I just see top of my list would probably be uh, Rudy Klumpenkrug. Klump and Klump. Oh, I hate that man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you can picture his miniature, can't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yes, it's uh, T. S. Lucas uh, is mm. the, uh, the 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 clump and clue creator mm. um uh, back when we were we were kicking around the starter set for for Wuffram. um and um, we were we we were starting off with just trying to get some really um uh iconic kind of like scenes and characters and things like that so you know ts and i spent ages kicking all of those around and uh i just remember the the uh, there was the glint in ts's eye where it is i've got one for you <laughs> i was like oh yes so good <laughs> well, hope, hopefully if people have their own favorites they can just petition games workshop just keep yeah. some things to let go and we demand I, we demand a i'm saying figure. nothing <laughs> <laughs> i i'd love to i'd love to see war scrolls for the sort of iconic characters that you use for like the start set yeah. things that would be really good to see i'd like to see that people do that that would be fun yeah, to see it, someone tinker with and stuff yeah. Yeah. it would depend on how you play them as well though wouldn't mm, it because if it's like true. my group it's sort of like you know there would be some heavy kind of like uh um rules for for managing to um snatch defeat from the jaws of victory <laughs> and uh... generally the dice do that for me anyway the free is anything but one should never be used so. <laughs> oh but yeah no i think i think um yeah it'd be great to see yeah get rude I, I think i think um yeah waffrup's got a you know such yes like i said you know first game and um it's um i think it's, it's certainly like some of the some of my the favorite writing of things that i've done as well you know yeah. I, I, think I, love, I loved doing the um uh, when, when i was trying to 
think of like what the, what I wanted the rule book to be like. Um, and the first thing that sort of popped into my head was, like, I think, a really sort of visual intro to the game um, and um, a little bit of a kind of, a, you know, kind of trying to do that kind of start of the season, the series or the movie where there's a bit of an introduction to the world and a mm-hmm. voiceover. Um, and um, uh, I thought, you know, go that journey from the borders of the empire into an imperial city or a city of the empire. Mm-hmm. Um, and the sort of the different stages obviously show off the barge and the canal, you know, the rivers and the canals and, and you know, a village and how weird uh, Warhammer Village would be. And uh, um, yeah, so it was it was great. So I mean, I did a, like a propaganda piece of the from the, mm-hmm. um, the obsequious courtier kind of um, extolling the virtues of the empire of of, uh, his Imperial Majesty Karl Franz, and um, and then a bit more of a you know a, a sarcastic um, street level kind of take on the same scene. So uh, um, yeah, that was uh, that was fantastic, and I think that that will take some some outdoing. But uh, <laughs> that's uh, I think the, the favourite bit that I've done so far. Um, yeah. So no, and then the Enemy Within as well, and, and even you know, our playtest of the Enemy Within I think ranks up there as you know easily one of the best games that I've played in, if not the best game. It was absolutely amazing. So uh, I can, um, yeah, wholeheartedly recommend that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in, in terms of sort of, you know, the, the, that kind of um, dreams come true and uh, and that sort of thing, I think that, yeah, that, that the whole the whole journey has been fantastic. Well, the journey is not quite over yet because there is one more thing we want to to have a little chat with you about Dom. Uh, you mentioned earlier that one of your very first uh, IPs was Victoriana, and it's yes. about to be revisited. Um, I, I suppose the best way is to show the the cover for the original, and then the cover for the the upcoming, just to show sort of <laughs> how it's times all have grown up. <laughs> I mean, th- there's our original Victoriana cover. Looking. Yeah, now no, this one actually predates Cubicle Seven. This one was yeah, um, Heresy Games. Oh, was Heresy first. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The I, um, I think the second edition was the first um, uh, Cubicle Seven one. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, um, yeah, it's been on quite a journey, isn't it? And yeah, that's, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and upcoming with this, so a. That's a lovely cover, isn't it? Every time I see it, I'm like, ooh, I want to go yeah, there. <laughs> um, that looks great. It's, uh, we've talked a little bit about this on the channel already, but um, what are the sort of the the main features of Victoriana for people who haven't heard about it and, and what what sort of plans do you have for the game and the, the, the world? So um, Victoriana is um, an a kind of alternate Victorian um uh, setting where you know steampunk and magic and the fantasy species have all kind of like um, uh, come together. So it's a um, uh, it it's always really hard to describe. <laughs> I should have a much better elevator pitch for this, shouldn't I? Um, but no, it's 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 zeppelins and magic and elves and um, you know eldrin as, as as we have them. Um, there's a um, uh, there's a peculiar flavour to it, I think, that comes from the fact that we've kind of grounded everything in as much of the horrible nastiness of the era mm-hmm. as possible. So, you know, we, we don't try and uh, brush too much under the carpet in terms of, you know, it, it was very unequal society. It was, um, you know, there, there was a lot of bad stuff um, going on, unenlightened stuff going on as well. So... Um, the, we, we've kind of focused that around class conflict. Um, so uh, the um, you know that, that's I think one of, one of the primary conflicts in there. So you know you have your know, progress in of itself. Obviously, is 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 not bad, um, but the way that some people will go about trying to use the progress and you know, technology to exploit others and to, um, you know that that's is bad. Now, in the past, like some people have described it as a little bit like Shadowrun um victorian era mm-hmm. um so you know that there's there's um uh yeah a sense of having to you know exist a bit on the outsides and uh, but you know, but use your con- your connections and contacts um to uh, get done what you need done but it's, mm-hmm. it's it's a bit of a fight for survival as well yeah it was interesting sort of when we talked to 
the folks behind this who've been working on it already and so they, they were sort of delving into the idea that it's not necessarily just about fighting things there's lots of stuff that you've put in there for sort of sleuthing and investigation and sort yeah. of really play with that even within the the 5e mechanics as well which is which is fascinating so. one thing i'm always really keen for us to do when you know when we do take on a 5e um uh so even really converge i mean you know, when, when when we're presenting a setting using mm-hmm. five years the rule set is um a, i don't i don't want to tinker with it too much you know i think people are coming to it because they know how 5e works and they don't you know that they're not looking for somebody's redesign um mm-hmm. but i think that there's where you've got um a, a, th- a thematic part of the setting that you can mm-hmm. include in a mechanical way then you know i think you know, that that's what I want to see us doing, you know, so that each iteration that we're doing, uh, or each setting that use, using Five E presents a, a something else that, um, or you know, a, a a a way of using uh, the Five E rules um, to to do something really interesting. Um, so yeah, so the uh, the investigative part of uh, Victoriana, I think, is um, a good example of that. Um, yeah, and there's uh, more coming soon on things that I can't talk about, um, which also take advantage of this kind of. <laughs> I was about to push you. I was about to be like, so what else do we have? But okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll oh, let you keep your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much at the moment as well. It's um, we're so close, but uh, yeah, they, they, they'll. Um, um, I think it'll be in the new year now yeah probably but um there we've got a lot of um things that are that are nearing completion um that are really exciting and yeah can't wait to to see what uh, next year should be start getting off to a, a good start um yes <laughs> oh, i wish i could talk no <laughs> well we'll we'll have to get you back on when you can talk mm. about it then to delve into it because it's a, good. it's an interesting setting um, mm. It has that blend of, I mean, steampunk as a genre itself is is always good fun. Blending it with the magic and the sci-fi, um, or the magic and the fantasy side is is interesting as well. And people are probably more open to things like that when you've got the likes of Carnival Row on TV and things. It, it's mm. it's a, an easier sell today than perhaps it would have been. 10, 15 years ago, where people would just be go, looking at it as a, oh, it's a fantasy version of Shadowrun. You're going, well, it's it's not that. It's it's a very different yeah. thing. And and the time period being set, the you know, Victoriana period where you've you've got social classes and all of that melding together, um, you can have very interesting, I suppose, games that aren't just hack and slash, but you've got the the investigative side, you've got the, the class war and, and competition sort of crashing against each other, where it may jo- not just be classes, but um, the various species as well. Uh, and and some interesting bits and pieces happen uh, in and around because it's, I want to say it's 1860 something. I think we were told we moved that it forward. Where, and yeah. I won't be able to remember the year now that we moved yeah. it forward to, but we wanted to be a little bit later Victorian for this, okay. uh, for the 5e version um to make our uh, make our, our steampunk shinier mm. so um, yeah, <laughs> so yeah there's some of that i think one of the problems we had with victoriana though was we, we designed it really to um to be as um you know as broad a game as possible because i think that, you know, there's lots of different styles of, of gaming that can go you know the people are, you know, find appealing for victorian era or mm. steampunk or um you know we, we, people might want to do more of a sherlock holmes kind of game or you know like a magician's kind of game so um so it was kind of like its strength and but also its weakness for explaining it to people because it was it, it, very broad it could do an awful lot of stuff it could tell a lot of a lot of different mm-hmm. stories so that was been one of the challenges which um, i think i've proved i haven't yet mastered is you know <laughs> getting to that That's really kind of like yeah yeah you know being able to explain it to people quickly um and what it's about but um yeah yeah i don't know well that just goes to show i need to put more work into that one <laughs> well I'll, I'll be fascinated to see it and to give it a go when it comes out yeah i, I can't wait to play it yeah i, I, f- I feel the urge to set set a, a group of investigators to find out who has been killing people in the west end of london in a top <laughs> hat and, and cape style you know because that's <laughs> in around the same time but really, really, there's so much you can do in these cases. Yep. Um, so oh, it's it's fascinating to see. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to sit down with you, Dom, uh, and to have this oh, chat. Thank you. Uh, if anybody has any questions about any of the things we've discussed, 
pop them below. We'll pass them across and uh, and maybe we'll get you an answer or maybe we'll have to come back and say, mm, we can't tell you that just yet. <laughs> otherwise, keep, keep an eye on the channel. Um, yeah. We'll have plenty more from Cubicle 7 in the future. But until then, bye-bye. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.